Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to go over some of the basics of working with storage on a Linux system. The main focus of this video will be related to working with local storage. First I'll list out disk available on the system. There are multiple ways to do this. I'm going to use lsblk without arguments, which returns some basic information about disk and partitions. So the kernel will detect the controller type of the disk and label devices based on that. On this system, I have disk identified as slash dev slash SDA slash dev slash SDB and slash dev slash VDA. The disk identified as being attached to the same type of controller will increment alphabetically. The same is displayed here with SDA and SDB. The S generally means it's a SCSI, SATA, or USB device. If the device name starts with V, it means it is something like vert IO bus type. The high level explanation is that vert IO drivers allow virtual machines to interface more efficiently with the hardware because it is virtualization aware. I'm not gonna get into a full explanation or discuss which virtual controller provides the best performance in this video. Virtualization is something I plan on discussing in a future video, but I'll drop some links in the description for those that are interested in learning more about virtual controllers. You also see names like this, and I'm just going to grab it and paste it here so that you can see it. And so you'll see something like dev MVME 0N1 and dev MVME 0N1P1. And so here, we have a device and here we'd have a partition. And these are referring to SSDs that are connected through either PCI or M.2 SSDs. And another block device naming scheme you might see is related to SD cards. And I'll just paste that so that we can see it here. And so here we have the device and then we have partitions. And so something like a Raspberry Pi, if you're using an SD card, you'll see something like that in your file system. And another identifier for devices starts with H. So see it like this, slash dev HDA, dev HDB. You probably won't see devices on your system identified like this these days, as this is associated with IDE or PETA interfaces that have been discontinued for a while now. I mention it here because I do see it occasionally while digging into an issue reading through older posts. Don't let that bit of output related to the identifier of obsolete interfaces throw you off though, as the rest of the info may help you solve the problem. Just wanted to mention that because you may see that out there. Now let's check out the partitions of a disk in a little more detail. And I'm just gonna bring back our LSBLK real quick here. And let's check out app disk. So this disk is partitioned into SDB1 through SDB3. The boot information is contained on its own partition and we can tell that it's using UEFI based on the mount point field provided in LSBLK, which lists that it is at boot EFI. The F disk output also shows that the type EFI is associated with SDB1 right here. And also the output tells us that the partition table type is GPT. With GPT, there is no concept of extended partitions. That's specific to MBR partition tables. I'll talk more about that shortly when we check out a disk using MBR. GPT can have a lot more partitions on a single disk up to 128 and allows for a much higher capacity. MBR is limited to two terabytes. So moving over to a system that's using MBR. Dev SDA is broken up into three partitions here as well. While the other host is using the GPT defaults, this host is using the default automatic Debian MBR partitions scheme. The first partition is dev SDA, which is root, as shown by the mount points, and contains the master boot record at the beginning of the disk. If we check out fdisk output, we can see it's flagged as bootable. 
marked here. Point out here that the disk label type is specified as DOS, which means that the partition table type is MBR. We also have another clue since partition SDA2 is of type extended. This partition can't be used to directly store data. The extended partition is here to allow for logical partitions to be contained within it. Since a disk using a, a MBR style partition table can only hold four primary partitions, an extended partition allows for the creation beyond that limit. While it's technically possible to allow an unlimited number of logical partitions, and from what I could find in the Microsoft documentation, Windows does not place a hard limit on the number of logical partitions allowed. According to the Linux documentation project, it is limited to 15 for SCSI disk and 63 on IDE disk. Red Hat documentation discussing logical partitions just calls out 15, likely due to the deprecation of IDE disk. Moving on to our next partition, which is the first logical partition, SDA5 contains our swap partition right here. I didn't manually specify this here. It was automatically selected during the install and I just left it at default. So I'm going to clear this up real quick and run another LSB OK to just go back to this for a moment. I'll point out device SR0 here. And in this case, this represents a virtual CD-ROM drive. If it was physical, it would still have the same naming convention with SR. And while physical optical drives aren't very common in systems these days, I frequently use virtual drives working with virtual machines. Nothing is currently mounted. And so if we run mount, and we can see it mounts it at media slash CD-ROM zero, and the mount path is now shown in our LSBLK output, and we can check it out at media CD-ROM zero. I'm not gonna to get too in depth with the mount command in this video, but that brings me to another way to identify disk. And so if I run LSBLK with the F option, it provides the UUID of the partitions. This is only one of the methods that can be used to obtain the UUID. Universally unique identifiers are more consistent versus using names like SDA. I'll come back to that in a moment. The output also provides the file system type along with the version as we see here. And so now going back to UUID, let's check out Etsy FS tab. The UUID is used here to tell the operating system where to mount our partitions. The CD-ROM device listed at the bottom is using the device name and the same style could be used to mount root or other partitions, but if there are multiple disks attached, names could change. For example, dev SDA could become dev SDB during the next boot, which might cause the system to fail to find the root partition and kick into rescue mode. There's some other ways to work around the issue, but using the UUID is straightforward and the recommended method. And so I'll do a quick run through what is in FS tab, but for anything I don't cover, run man FS tab for more explanation. And so here, of course, we have the identifier and we can see that here and here as well. And then we have the mount point. And so this is for root. And you notice that swap is set to none because we're not really mounting it in the same way. It's just made available to the system. And then moving on to the third field here, we have the file system type. Root partition is the XT4. Swap is identified as swap. And there are actually two items specified here for the CD-ROM drive. And then over in this fourth field, we have various options that can be set here. In this case, the root partition is set to mount as read only if there's a problem mounting normally. And then this is the required option for swap. And the CD-ROM drive is set to no auto, which means it will not mount at boot automatically or when running a mount command with dash A. Recall that I had to manually mount the device earlier. And then the fifth field here, which are these first zeros, are related to using dump to back up a file system. It 
it's limited to ext 2 3 and 4 file systems i've never personally used it on any of my systems and i've never seen it in use while working as a system administrator so if you're interested you can check out the dump man page or read through the package info with using your package management tool the sixth field is used by fs check to determine the order of checks during boot here root is set to one as it should be so let's check first Swap and the virtual CD-ROM drive are set to zero, which is disabled. So check out FS tab and FS check man pages for more details on that. I'm gonna run through a simple example of setting up swap. So first let's check out swap using the free command. Here we can see some memory and swap statistics. Now I'm going to disable swap. Now we see that swap is disabled. Since the partition is already set, I could just run a command and enable it, but let's treat this like we're setting up fresh. I can run make swap to set up swap. And to activate, Notice that a UUID was generated with make swap, which is different from the entry in FS tab. And so the system won't be able to find anything with that UUID when starting up. It won't cause a boot failure and throw the system into rescue mode, but it will cause a delay since it tries until the timeout is reached, after which it continues the boot process. Also, since it couldn't be found, it won't be active. I'm not gonna worry about changing right now, but I could take the output provided here and update FS tab. I can also run a command to get the UUID. So we can get, also get UUIDs with the other methods we've seen, and we can get it with this command as well, block ID. And you do need to be running with sudo or as root. And here we have our UUIDs for each item. Now let's check out partitioning a disk. I have the extra vert IO virtual disk on the system. I'll start by running gdisk. A quick reminder to be careful when using partitioning tools. To, to commit changes, gdisk takes w as a command. and also prompts for confirmation, so you can back out to discard the changes if you make a mistake. And just a quick lsblk, there is vda. So we'll go disk against it. Here we see the line creating new GPT entries in memory. So it will not be applied until I write the changes. And as shown, we can use question to get the help. And what I want is a new partition. So I'll enter N. I'll leave that at default. I'll also leave it at the default for sector. And then I want this to be of size one G because I'm going to create two partitions here. Here I want 83 for Linux file system. Then I'm gonna go ahead and hit N again for another new partition. Leave that at default. I grab up first sector through the rest of the available space 83 again for linux i'm going to go ahead and hit w to write the changes and y to confirm and let's check it out now now we can see that we have two partitions on our device here and so i'll run through creating a file system on each of the new partitions so starting with VDA1, let's go ahead and run afs.dxt4. And then let's use xfs on the other part. Go ahead and mount those at some directories I've created here.
And here we can see the new partitions are mounted and of the types that we created. And so I tried to keep it pretty high level for most of the topics covered here. I know I kind of jumped around to some different things, but I really want to make this video for newer Linux users. Hopefully that gives you a good start on how you can examine some of these things in your system and figure out what's going on. And just some demo of performing some basic tasks, working with some disk and storage. So if you found this video helpful, please like and consider subscribing to the channel. And thanks for watching.